worthy of it all. Amen. I've titled my message today, Sons of God Understand His Purpose. And we're going to look at God's purpose. It says in Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 21, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. You got it? Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it's the Lord's purpose that will stand. Janet was saying how big he is. In Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, it says, I am the Lord, I am God, and there is none like me. No one even comes close. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand. I will accomplish all my purpose. I want you to notice this. It doesn't say purposes. It says my purpose. God has a purpose that he's been working on for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Hasn't changed his purpose. The devil's tried to stop his purpose. Mankind has tried to stop his purpose. But he, when he looks down at their efforts, he says... He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Derision means their puny efforts it, compared to what he is capable of doing, what they're doing to try and stop him is just nothing. God sits in the heaven and laughs. So here's God's purpose statement. Where would you find it? In the first book, in the first chapter of the scriptures. This is his purpose statement. This has been his purpose for a long, 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 long time. Then God said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them have dominion over all the animal kingdom, all the birds, all the all the cattle, all the fish, everything that creeps. Notice he doesn't say over other people. He didn't give you dominion over other people. But this is his purpose statement. Hasn't changed. In fact, he says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He had this purpose before he created everything. In fact, he created everything to fulfill this purpose. This purpose couldn't have been fulfilled unless he created the heavens and the earth. But he had this purpose before. You know, we built a house a few years ago. Some of you had the experience of building a new house and you you get it all planned out. You you know the end of it before you start. You sign the contract with the builder after you've sorted out all the details. You start at the end because this is what the end product looks like and this is what we put in place to get the end product. God does the same thing. He's after an end product, the result of his purpose. And his purpose is to have men and women in the image and likeness of God. Verse 11 of chapter 1 of Ephesians says, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him, 
who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. He only has one purpose, to bring us to a place where we are conformed to his image and likeness. But I want to um, look at this idea of being chosen. I think there's a movie like that, isn't it Chosen? Or was it Frozen? <laughs> chosen. What does it mean to be chosen? And it's important to understand what it means to be chosen because you will misunderstand the scriptures if you misunderstand what it means to be chosen. And what does it mean to be predestined? See, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, which Janet talked about at communion. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever accepts him as Lord and Saviour will have eternal life, will not perish, but have eternal life. So how does that fit with this? Because it's got to fit. Because the scripture doesn't contradict itself. Well, we find out in Ephesians that he explains what it means to be chosen. Job 36 and verse 5 says, God is mighty and despises no one. He is mighty and firm in his purpose. It's the same purpose. But he's not choosing. He says that he doesn't show favoritism. There is a way that he is predetermined. Predestined means that he has predetermined. You know, when you build a house, you predetermine the fittings in it, the, the taps and the, the light switches and the light fittings and everything down to the finest detail. You predetermine that before you start. What does it mean to be chosen? And in verse 11 of Ephesians, it's found that says, In him you were also chosen. Also? What does that mean? Having been predestined according to the plan of him who works ev out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will. What does it mean? I was talking to a lady some years ago. And um, she said she had uh, someone staying at her house, a young guy, and he was asking about salvation. But he, she, um, she believed in predestination, that you were chosen before the foundation of the earth. You were individually chosen. God said, I'll choose that one, that one, that one, but I'm not choosing them. That's the predestination doctrine. And you have no choice. No choice whether you get chosen or not it's actually forced on you. you you don't have a choice and God for God that doesn't work because when Adam and Eve were created they weren't quite in the image of God I got a bigger reaction this morning John they weren't quite in the image of God what are you talking about well, God couldn't make them exactly like him and achieve his purpose because they were immature. If they had been mature, they wouldn't have eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil because they would have been like God. But they were immature. They had no experience. And so we need experience in life. We know, know what to what to accept and what not to accept. 
They didn't really know what they were doing. But God couldn't make them with experience because he would have had to override their free will. And that wasn't part of his plan. His plan was that he wanted a humanity who would love him of their own free will. If you think about it, if you were forced to marry someone, how would that go down? In some countries they do that. But you're in love with someone else and you're forced to marry someone. Well, God wants us to love him of our own free will. And you can't get someone to love you if you hold a gun at their head. They just won't. They, they will say they love you, but they won't love you. It would be just a sham. And God doesn't want a sham. He wants genuine people who love him because of who he is. Verse 12 says, In order that we who first who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Now we're getting somewhere. He said, we who put it first put our hope in Christ, we are now chosen. We're now chosen. Just to confirm that, we'll go to the next verse. He said, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. When did you get included? when you heard the message of truth, when you responded to it, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked with, in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. It says in Matthew 22 and verse 14, remember the, the parable of the wedding feast and they, the master sent, the, the guest didn't come? They refused to come. I, got, I just brought some cattle. I need to go and try them out. I just married a wife. I can't come. So he sent them out into highways and byways and invited as many as would come. He said in verse 14, many have been invited, but few are chosen. Because it's only those who choose to accept the invitation that become chosen. These are the ones, he said, before the foundation of the world, that they would be conformed to the image of his son. Those are the ones who would be conformed to the image and likeness of God himself. Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Who does it work together for good for? Those who love God. It doesn't apply to those who don't love God. It only applies to those who do love God. God will work it out for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Those who respond to the call become the chosen ones. I think it's pretty plain through Ephesians there that that's what it is. He didn't say, I'll pick you and pick you and pick you and not you and not you and not you. He says he doesn't discrim discriminate on that basis. The basis he discriminates on is whether you accept the invitation or not. That's the story of the parable of the wedding feast. Verse 29 says, For those he foreknew, and this really means those he foreloved, God so loved the world. He loved every person, and every person is welcome. Every person can choose if they so wish. The Holy Spirit invites us to be part of his eternal purpose. But we have to respond to it. We have to say, yes, count me in on that. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. 
and I believe that God raised him from the dead and that my sins have been dealt with and washed away. And my sinful nature has even been dealt with according to Colossians 2 and Romans 6. It says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Jesus was in the image of his Father. If we're conformed to the image of his Son, then we'll be conformed to the image of God. In his image and likeness, it's only those who respond. Who believes we're in the last days? Well, I've got an end time message today. This is the end time message. It's different to the end time messages you heard before. But as far as I can see, after Revelation 5, the church is not in the book of Revelation until chapter 22 when she descends out of heaven as a bride, adorned for her husband. And when I look at the scriptures, when I see God's judgment come on the earth, and it came in the days of Noah, and what did God do? Noah was righteous in his generation. And so he took the righteous and spared them from the judgment. He got them to build an ark so they could ride above the judgment that killed everybody else but brought them to safety. You know... Um, God made a covenant with Adam and there was nothing in that covenant he could do until the world had got so bad that the DNA of the human race had been so contaminated that everyone except Noah and his family left on the earth were crossbred and the covenant didn't apply to them. So God keeps his covenant. You've got to understand that. God keeps his covenant. But he made a new covenant with Noah. Remember that? And he repeated the covenant he made with Adam with one addition. The one addition was, I will not flood the earth again and destroy humanity. And what he was saying there, and we misunderstand what he was saying there, because what he was saying is, I will not let it get to this state again. I can't let it get to this state again. Noah, we're coming to agreement. I'm going to intervene if it goes past a certain point. And we see that happening. Before we didn't see it, God didn't intervene. He let things run until the flood came. But in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, they got, they'd passed God's tolerance level. And God told Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And, but God went down and pulled the righteous out. It says, I think it's Peter says, righteous Lot. Was Lot righteous? Well, the scripture says he was righteous. Him and his wife and his daughters escaped but his wife looked back desiring the things of the world got distracted we're in the last days and God is going to do things in the last days that he hasn't done any other time he said we read it in that verse that the things that he's planned have not yet been done But he's going to do something in the last days before Jesus comes back. He's going to have a people, which the scriptures in Romans 8 call the sons of God. The whole world is groaning in travail, waiting for the appearance of the sons of God. And Paul says they're going to appear. They're going to be the ones who are walking in his image and likeness on the earth. And so we see this repeated throughout Scripture and I wanted to show you that we've been taught in the past 
that we won't reach perfection or we won't reach this state of being in his image and likeness until Jesus comes back and we'll be changed in a twinkling instant. We'll, this immortality will put on this mortality will put on immortality. Don't turn off. I want to prove it to you. It says in Romans it says that we will be conformed to the image of his son. In Ephesians he says the fivefold minister will be in place until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the st measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That means that we conform, we get changed into the image of Christ. Second Corinthians three eighteen says, "And we, all with unveiled face, behold the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same." into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit so what he's telling us Paul's telling us here is that you get changed little by little it's a process it's not something that's going to happen in an instant when we get caught up this mortal will put on immortality that's true but being changed into his image and likeness God's going to have a people on the earth before the judgment comes who will declare his glory, who will show the world a witness. And this group of people, they just won't be doing the things that Jesus did. They'll be doing the things that are said in John fourteen twelve, that anyone who has faith in me will do even greater things that I've been doing because I'm going to the Father. This is the end time message for the church. And so we see in 1 John 3, 2, it says, Beloved, we are God's children now. Do you believe you're God's child now? Are you living in that reality? Or are you not quite sure? If you're saved, if you've given your life to Christ, if you're following Christ, you are God's child now. You've been born again. And what we will be has not yet appeared. Well, in John's day, that was true. Okay? That was 2,000 years ago. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. It's not saying here that when he appears, we'll be changed in an instant because in in Corinthians, it said we are getting changed from one level of glory to another level of glory into his image. And so to say that we're going to be changed in an instant contradicts other scriptures. And that's what, not what this is saying. It's actually saying that when he appears, we will already be like him. But we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. Haggai <coughs> writes in second chapter in verse 9, The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. In this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Interesting here, what is the latter house? Um, Haggai was prophesying about the temple that was being rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity. But before the Babylonian captivity, the glory of the Lord resided in the temple, in the most holy place, above the mercy seat and between the cherubim. The glory of God, the, the Shekinah glory of God, dwelt there. And if you wanted to experience the glory of God, you had to go to Jerusalem and go to the temple because that's the only place on earth that it was. But before the Babylonian captivity, the glory of the Lord left the temple. And after they rebuilt the temple, the glory of God never came back. There's no record of it coming back into the temple. 
it did later on because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the glory of God came back in us because the glory of God and the Holy Spirit resides in us. And so the glory of the latter house is the latter house at the end of this age. Peter writes that we are living stones built up into a holy temple to house the presence of God. Individually, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Collectively, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what he's telling us here is that the glory of the latter house will be more glorious than the former. Are you ready? Because he wants to do it. But he won't do it unless you ask him to. Because out throughout the scriptures, God never forced anything on humanity. Otherwise, his purpose would not be achieved. And so he invites us to respond to the gospel. And if we respond to the gospel, we get chosen. But we have to invite him to bring us into this as well. Because he will not The word molest comes to mind. He will not molest us. He will not force us. He will not force himself on us. We have to come into a relationship with him where we agree as a husband and wife agrees. And there's a scripture there, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, your bo- that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit with, and the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? The Shekinah glory of God dwells within you. And he is going to become more manifested because it's the spirit of God that changes us into the image of Christ so in Revelation 19 and verse 7 it says let us rejoice and exult and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready there's a part that we play in this but what this is about is that there was a time when Paul was talking in Romans 8 he said the whole world is waiting for the time when the manifestation of the sons of God will happen and will free it from bondage the whole world is groaning in travail waiting for this event to happen They could see it in the future. It wasn't in Paul's day. And so the church of this day, those who are walking in the Spirit, those who will be manifested as the sons of God, will be walking in such power and authority that the world will have a witness that God is real. Will people accept it? A lot of people will not accept God. They don't, do, do not want to be told what to do. They do not want to submit their lives. They, do you know, in America, I was watching a program a few years ago now, but in America I think there's about 800,000 people who are in solitary confinement They're in solitary confinement. They can get out if they want to. All they've got to do is behave themselves. But they won't behave themselves. Their attitude is, no one's telling me what to do. And that attitude is amongst humanity. Those people don't get chosen. It's those who come into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ that get chosen. 
And God has a special purpose in the end of the age that before he comes back, he's going to have a company of people that are called the sons of God that will be changed and conform to his image and likeness and they will walk in his power and authority. They will do even greater exploits than the book of Acts because the glory of the latter house is going to be more glorious than the former house. Do you believe it? Well, we need to ask God for his purpose to be realised in us. That his purpose be realised for this church. That he will be glorified. That his name will be held on high. That he will be magnified. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. He's called us. He's calling everyone. Everyone that, that will hear, everyone that will respond can, have, can be chosen. Everyone. And if you haven't chosen, then it's time for you to choose. Choose God. Choose life. Choose blessing. Goes on to say, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. That would be like him, wouldn't it? If you don't be partaker of his divine nature, you'll be like him. You'll be in his image and likeness. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. God has a plan, has a purpose. He's had this plan and purpose for since he started creating the material realm. I don't know how long that is. Because it says in chapter 1 of Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then he says, let there be light. And there was light. And then the first day happened. We don't know how long that is. We don't even know how long that day was because there's no sun at that time. What constituted the evening and morning, we don't know. Because darkness was upon the face of the deep. Darkness was upon the face of the earth. But before all that happened, God had his purpose. He said, I'm going to, I know what I'm doing. I'm creating mankind and they will become my image and likeness. They will conform to my image and likeness. They will be just like me. That is staggering. They will be just like me. Because they're my kids. You know, so your kids do things that are just like you. I think sometimes my mum would have done that. So we need to ask him because if we don't ask, we don't receive. That's what it says in Luke 11. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Listen to what I'm saying. Unless you ask, you will not receive. Unless you seek, you will not find. The world is trying at the moment to distract us from the purposes of God. Don't get distracted. He's out here saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. 
And we know that when Peter walked on the water and he kept his eyes on Jesus, he walked on the water. But when he took his eyes off Jesus and looked at the things happening about him, what happened? He sunk. And we're living in a day where the world is saying, look at this, look at this, look at this. And we just read there that he will achieve his purpose. The, the devil or the world or anything in it will not stop his purpose from being achieved. That's what we read. He works everything together for good for those who love God and called according to his purpose. He loves us with an everlasting love. He wants the best for us. The best is to fulfill the purpose he designed us for. You know, boats are made to travel on water. They're no good on the road. And cars are no good in the water because it's not their purpose. God made everything for a purpose. Fish can't breathe water. I breathe um, air and we can't breathe water because we're not made for that. So God has chosen everything for his purpose. But our purpose is to be conformed to the image of God. In, in his image and likeness, in every way, we'll be like God. And when we come to that, God can trust us and we'll co-labor with him. And we'll see amazing things. But we have to pursue it. Amen? Father, we thank you for everything that you've purposed for us. You put everything in place. You, you just um, made the heavens and the earth, the stars, and the, everything that we can see materially. You made them for us so that we could fulfill your purpose. You've designed us so we can fulfill your purpose. There's nothing that the enemy can do or there's nothing that man can do that will stop your purpose from being realized. And so, Lord, we give you thanks that you do work everything for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so, Lord, we give you thanks. We are so grateful that you invited us and that the Holy Spirit wooed us to you. So, Lord, we ask you to lead us into your purpose, that we might all fulfill your purpose in our lives, that we might see the glory of God, the knowledge of the glory of God, fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.